From the time that she was young, my guest knew she wanted to be a lawyer. Many people in her life supported her, but when she got to law school, some of her professors actually told her that she didn't belong there because she was a woman. After graduation, law firms said they couldn't hire her because their clients wouldn't want a woman lawyer. But she persisted. She found work as a legal aid attorney. Then she went to work in the Vermilion County State's Attorney's Office. Her life really changed when a judge told her that she would make a good judge, and he was certainly correct. Over the last 40 years, she's worked at every level of the state's court system, and today she serves as the Chief Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court. I'm very pleased to welcome to Illinois Pioneers Justice Rita Garman. Thank you very much Thank you. for being here. So when do you remember a particular point when you were young, when you knew that you wanted a career in law? Not a defining moment, but I was probably 15 or 16 years old and I was looking at what was I going to do with my life and I decided, I think I want to be a lawyer. And what appealed to me about the law was that it is so diverse. In other mm -hmm. words, there's so many different directions you can go as a lawyer. I couldn't have seen myself as a judge. Uh, I saw myself more as a uh, civil lawyer or doing school law, for example, that, that sort of thing. But I, I knew that it was a career that, I, that would interest me. Yeah. It must have been, though, at the time, there, I have no idea how many women there were in the legal profession at the time, but I would mm -hmm. think that there wouldn't be many. And were there women that you could point to as role models for, none. for you? No. None. Uh, I, there were no women uh, attorneys practicing in Vermilion County when I, uh, when I arrived in Vermilion County. Mm -hmm. And there were very, very few women uh, anywhere practicing law. Uh, actually, when I went on the bench, there were less than 10 women statewide in Illinois who were, who were judges. Yeah, I think when you became a judge, uh, you were the first woman in your circuit I was. to be a, a trial court judge. I was. And only the second woman ever to go to the Illinois Supreme Court? That's correct. That's and correct. the second to be the Chief Justice. That's right, that's correct. You came to the University of Illinois, I think pre, perhaps because a number of your family members had gone to school here. Yes, with my, with my father's strong encouragement, but my sister had been here before me, so she graduated in uh, 1960, and so obviously I'd spent some time at the, in Champaign-Urbana, mm. and so I knew it was an exciting place to be. Yeah. So you came to the University of Illinois, you studied economics? I did. Well, actually, I, I started in commerce and law because that was a six-year joint degree program that would get me a, a bachelor's degree and a law degree at the end of six years. Mm -hmm. And the first year I was in the program, my advisor talked me out of being in the program. He said, you know, you, when you get that far, when you get to be your senior year of college would be your first year of law school. And if you get that far and, and you, lo you don't like law school or if law school doesn't like you, and those were his exact words, uh, you'll have to uh, go back and try to pick up enough courses to have a major. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna cost you a year. So you're better served to get a bachelor's degree in a defined topic, subject, and then go to law school. And then if things don't work out in law school, then you're free to move on to something else. Yeah. So I thought that was good advice, so I changed my major then to economics. And you met your husband when you were an undergrad? He was also in the, the same program? He, he was in, no, no, he was yeah. in economics, but he was in liberal arts and sciences. Yeah. But we both ended up in a very popular labor economics class. Uh, it was taught by the late Professor E.B. McNatt. And it was, it was a, a course that was uh, over, actually over books. So there were more students in the class than they could accommodate. And, but he and I ended up being in the same class. Mm -hmm. So I think that I read that when it came time for you to go to law school, they were going to go to mm -hmm. Iowa, right. he had some kind of offer to go to work for the National Security Agency? He did, he did. They determined that he was, would have been very good at, at uh, analyzing and breaking codes. Mm. Uh, but he also decided he wanted to go to law school. He had two uncles that were lawyers and it appealed to him. So he decided to forego the opportunity with the federal government and pursue law school. And did you have something to do with that? I think I did, <laughs> I think I did. I think we wanted to be together. So we went on the adventure to law school. Mm. I want to have you talk about some of your experiences at law school. And as I mentioned at the beginning, 
Some of your professors there, I don't know how they put it, but essentially they said to you, you don't belong here? Well, they, there were some that made that statement, uh, others that were, were indifferent uh, about it. But I truthfully never wore anything but gray or black or dark brown when I was in law school because I really didn't want to stand out. And we were graded by numbers, so they, they didn't have any idea who was writing uh, the exam. So that worked to my benefit. But and it really wasn't, no one was uh, uh, terribly encouraging to, uh, at the time. The, the dean of the law school at Iowa was uh, the late Mason Ladd, and he was very welcoming. Other schools, I understand, uh, deans were not so welcoming to women students. Uh, uh, professor uh, and, former, and Dean Nina Appel tells the story of being in law school, and the, and the dean took the w women to his home and suggested they all leave. So, and that was a, she was she's a contemporary. Mm -hmm. So this this was not an uncommon or an unusual. Uh, uh, environmental factor. And there were, I think your class was 100, there were only five women out of there those 100? There were more, more like 150 or 160 in the class, and there were eight women eight. started and uh, five women finished. When you graduated, and, and graduated with honors, and so you, yes. you certainly uh, did well, had a good experience, then you went out looking for work. I did. What happened when you went to law firms and, and started doing interviews. Well, I when I interviewed, I interviewed with a bank in Chicago, the Continental Bank in Chicago at the mm -hmm. time as a trust officer. And I was offered a position uh, at, at the bank. And another one of my classmates was also interviewing and he was offered a position at the bank. He was offered $1,500 a year more than I was for the same job. Now in 1968, $1,500 was a huge differential because starting salaries for most downstate lawyers at that time was probably about $7,500 a year. So $1,500 was, was enormous. Mm -hmm. But it was for the same job. And my academic record was better than my classmates' record. Uh, when I went to, when I talked to law firms, if, if I could get in the door, uh, many of them wouldn't even interview you. Then, then I heard about, well, you're a nice lady and you have a distinguished record, but but we couldn't use you. How would we possibly? How could we possibly use your services? Uh, can you make coffee? Uh, can you type? Those kinds of yeah. questions uh, were were frequent. And I think that that uh, I'm sure that other women I've heard Sandra Day O'Connor essentially okay. the say uh, tell exactly. the same story that other women face the same thing, and that uh, things were said to them that today you could not imagine no. saying. In fact, when I r recount these uh, adventures to younger women today, and particularly young law students, they're horrified. Uh, and many of them say, and, and of course many of the faculty members also today will say, you know, well, what did you do? Uh, well, I answered the questions as best I could without embarrassing myself or without, uh, em you know, embarrassing the questioner because I wanted a job. So you had to play the game. So it ended up, you ended up in Danville, I and did. your your first job, the job that you could get, was as a, a legal aid attorney. Well, and that came about uh, quite by accident, because mm -hmm. I couldn't get an interview with the state's attorney's office, and I was interviewing, my husband got a job with the firm he was with his entire career, but, and so I was looking around, and when I interviewed in, in the industry, they told me I was overqualified, because I had a law degree. So I was looking around and I wasn't being very successful at it, but the legal aid director walked out of the office and it was a one person office and they didn't have anybody to keep the doors open. And at that time it was funded by what was called the Office of Economic Opportunity and they really thought they might close the office. So the chairman of the legal aid board called me uh, in uh, probably October of 1968 and we'd arrived here in September and said basically, well, you're not doing anything, are you? Uh, would you come down and keep the doors of the legal aid office open? And it, we may clo it may close, because the government may shut us down, but we would appreciate it if you could come in and, and talk to people you can, you can and help those people you can, but uh, kind of don't do anything that's too prolonged because you might not be here. 
So, so I went, I said to him, well, I've never practiced law. What do I know about running a law office? And he said, well, if you'll come down and do that, the members of the committee will help you. And if you don't know how to do something or you need advice, you're free to call on any of us. And they were true to their word. They were real gentlemen and were very supportive and actually turned out to be my first mentors. So I went to the legal aid office and I found very quickly that the people that came to legal aid didn't care that I was a woman and they didn't care that I was young. They were very happy to have someone to talk to and someone that could help them address some of their issues. So that's how I started to practice law. And as I, then I went to the courthouse and filing papers and, and having hearings and found that the deputy clerks of the court were very helpful to me and the judges were very nice to me. And uh, so that's how I learned to practice law. Yeah. And uh, then, then as I practiced law, after I had been at Legal Aid about, uh, oh, I would say 10 months to a year, one day the, the state's attorney came into the Legal Aid office and he said he wanted me to come to the state's attorney's office and handle the family cases. You know, the non-supports, the juvenile cases, mental health cases, and that, and that sort of thing. And really that's how many, many women integrated into the practice of law because they, people could kind of see a woman doing family work, but they, you know, they would have had diff more difficulty seeing a woman doing civil litigation, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started my practice of law. Well, the fact that when you started out, you were working with people who were really in trouble, mm -hmm. I'm sure had no idea how to negotiate the court system. They couldn't afford to have an attorney. Mm -hmm. They were, right. really, they were really lost and they really needed help. Yes. How did working with that kind of client maybe shape the way that you looked at the law or what lawyers did? Oh, I think it had a, a definite impact on the way I practice law and the way I look at the law because I became very aware of the impact of the law on people. And I became very aware that the size of the case really is irrelevant. It's very important to the people that are involved in that case. It's everything to them. And so you really, it really gave me a, a great sense of, as I say, of the impact of the law mm -hmm. and, and a sensitivity to uh, people's issues. As I said at the beginning, I think an important, very important turning point mm -hmm. for you was that point when I think it, one of the judges there yes. In, yes. in the circuit where you were working said to you, well, had you ever, had you yeah. ever thought about being a judge? He did. He did. I, I was very flattered and, and really shocked. Uh, and I said, well, no. And he said, well, you should think about it. And then he said, you have the right ability to do it and you have the right temperament to do it. And I really think you'd enjoy it. So that planted the seed that, well, maybe that would be something I would like. And I always mm -hmm. did like to see both sides. So that was, that was a, great uh, thing uh, for me to think about. Yeah. If someone decides they want to be a lawyer, mm -hmm. you go to law school and you take mm -hmm. your classes, but then I'm sure the way you learn to be a lawyer is sure. by doing it. You, you learn yes, it on the job. Yes. So having said that then, how do you learn how to be a judge? <laughs> well, through practice and experience. When I became a judge, there was, we didn't have any ceremony. I said to the chief judge, uh, well, now what do I do? And he said, show up January 7th and there's your courtroom. And so I went in and I had a black robe and I had a small claims call to uh, dispose of. So you really learn to be a judge. I learned from observing the judges I appeared before mm -hmm. and seeing the, the, the traits that I thought were appealing and those that I thought were effective and some that I, I didn't think were so good. So yeah. I just, that's how I really began to chart my, how, mm -hmm. chart my course. So no, you, you, no one hands you a book, says no, here's, here's no. the rule book on how to be a judge. No, no, no. And uh, so that you go from there. And in fact, we, today we do things differently because mm -hmm. all new judges go to judge, new judges school that lasts a week and they're exposed to all the different areas of the law and really to get them started when the, in being a, a judge. Mm -hmm. And we also now have mentors. So we have more senior judges that actually undertake to uh, 
answer any questions the new judges have and to help them bridge the gap from practice to the bench. Yeah. I, but I don't know what would happen if we went on and we started asking people, well, what exactly do you think a judge does? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm guessing that there are some people who, who would think, well, once all testimony has been heard, then the judge goes back to his or her chambers and you know we know what law offices look like they're books mm -hmm. yes f everywhere so I, I expect that maybe some people think that well really the answer to any question is in some book somewhere mm -hmm. and it, all you have to do is find the right book pull it down and open it up and mm -hmm. it will say oh okay this is yes. this is how I should decide this yes that's it's not like no that. it's not like, <laughs> it's like not that, like that. But, and you know what, before I went to law school, when I was a kid, I used to think, well, when you finish law school, you, did it. you had the definitive answers to everything. And if someone asks you, what is, what is the law on this particular subject, mm -hmm. you'd be able to just reel that off and talk about it. Well, in fact, I learned very quickly, that's not the way it is at all. In fact, in law school, they really teach you how to think and how to analyze uh, problems and, and situations. And of course, then there's statutory law and there's decisional law. One of the things you, that a lawyer learns early on is there, there are many questions that come up where there is no definitive answer. So you're kind of ch you're charting new territory as you go along. Mm -hmm. But it is challenging to keep abreast of all the developments in the law and to be knowledgeable and have an inquiring mind uh, so that you are you don't just take it, uh, well, I, I know this is the way it is and it doesn't change because the law does change. Mm -hmm. And that, you can certainly see how that would apply to the high court, mm -hmm. but does that even apply when you're a trial judge? That oh, there, there are always cases where certainly. there is no definitive answer to whatever the, the big questions oh, are? Oh, certainly, and uh, lots of times the, one of the issues would be whether this fact pattern fits into this particular analysis of the law, or is it, is it the same or is it different? And if it is different, why is it different? And why would that compel a different, uh, a different outcome? Hmm. I, I, I don't think that people would be comfortable with the idea that judges are swayed by public opinion. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think, we recognize that the judges are they're, they're people of their time, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly we understand that people can change their minds, and you know, as opinion generally shifts, I imagine judges and the way that they think about things shift. Mm -hmm. How do you think about, or do you think about, where the public is on any particular issue as you make your decisions? Well. You are correct. Public opinion doesn't uh, doesn't uh, decide the case, uh, and we don't uh, we don't decide whether 51 percent of the people would favor this result or not. Uh, we look at the we look at the case, look at the analysis of the case, the facts of the case. How does it fit in with the existing law? If it doesn't fit in with existing law, what should the law be, and what's the impact of that decision? Because certainly in the Supreme Court, every case we decide has an impact not only on the parties to that particular case, but on everybody else. So there's a, there's a tremendous ripple effect uh, to the decisions that are made. So we are always mindful of, of what impact does this decision have. Not, we're always, of course, aware that it's going to have an impact on these people, but what's the what's the general impact hmm. uh, how does this you know how does that play out so it is a uh, you know a, a certainly a part of the analysis but the in, the legal analysis is driven by all the the law that you can find and then applying the law to the facts of the case but you you couldn't help you and i suppose any other judge right. couldn't help but bring to the bench with you all of your life Certainly. experience and, and how you feel about m about things and, and yeah. you can't really keep that out of the decision making process can you? No, uh, well I think it that probably comes in uh, strongly in assessing credibility or in deciding you know f f at what happened factually because mm -hmm. oftentimes in a trial there are divergent 
uh, assessments of what the facts show. And the judge has to decide. So your experiences in life do form, help form your way of, of reaching opinions. I think that's why diversity on the bench is so important, so that when people go to court, they, they know they have a sh chance of seeing somebody that looks like them. Yeah. Well, just sort of one further question about gauging opinion. Mm -hmm. Supposing that um, there is a case that is widely expected that's going to come before the court, and you know those of us in the media, if if this is something that will affect a lot of people, mm -hmm. we're going to write about it, mm -hmm. and we will go out and we will ask law professors and politicians and and things that we'll, that we'll say, particularly uh, I'm talking about the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. We'll say to them, well, what do you think the court is going to do? Mm -hmm. How do you think the court will decide mm -hmm. this? And they'll give us an answer. And editorial writers certainly will say, well, based on what we know about the court and past decisions, we think this is what the court will do. Do you read that? Do you read editorials? Do you read stories about the cases that you know that you will hear? And do, does any of that chatter about <laughs> what somebody thinks you will do have an impact on you? Generally, I don't read um, much of that, that if, mm -hmm. the, if the matter is under advisement. And once the case has been decided, I, you know, I probably will read editorials. Um, sometimes I agree with what they said, and sometimes I, I don't agree with, uh, with what, they, what they say. But what, what they're trying to do and really is read the tea leaves to decide how is this, how is this going to be decided. And I can tell you in the, in the Illinois Supreme Court, there's seven justices of the court. We all come at this process from different life experiences, and there are different analysis that that come into play. So the hopefully the product that we ultimately produce has had the richness of a lot of input from from uh, people of all experiences in life and all kinds of legal experiences and different different views. Mm -hmm. So what what comes down really has been. Uh, has been tested and argued about, and uh, and then a decision has been made. Mm. You talked a, a moment ago about the importance of diversity mm -hmm. on the bench, and I know that's something that you have, have talked mm -hmm. about before. Currently, there are three women yes. on the Illinois Supreme Court. Yes. And uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you when you came on to the court, you were only the second yes. woman to be on the court. And the the first... This was Marianne McMorrow. McMorrow. Yes. She joined the court in 1992, so that was the yeah. first from 1818 to That's 1992. Right. That's right. No women until she got there, and that was uh, almost a, a decade, or maybe a little bit more, after Sandra Day O'Connor was already on the, right. the U.S. Supreme Court. Why did it take so long for there to be a woman on the Illinois Supreme Court? Well. Probably because it took a while for women to gain the requisite experience to really be credible candidates mm -hmm. for that uh, position. And Justice McMorrow had served in the lower courts and was on the appellate court. And so she had the requisite uh, ability and, and experience to be a viable candidate for the court. Mm -hmm. so, so really it just takes there's a certain amount of time evolution that has to take place before you, uh, you know, really are a seasoned uh, jurist and ready to explore that that level. So, so when you joined the court, did uh, Justice uh, McMorrow did she have any particular advice for you based on her experience as the the first woman on the court? Well, she was, of course, it was the first time in my judicial career that I wasn't the first woman in the room. So for me, it was, uh, it was quite a, a, an enlightening and wonderful experience. And Justice McMorrow was a, a dear woman uh, and a, a lady in every regard and, and a very caring and compassionate and tough person. She mm -hmm. had been, she actually had been in the state's attorney's office years ago in, in Cook County and tried a murder case and that case went up on appeal, and she prepared it. Went to the Supreme Court. She prepared it, and she was getting ready to go to argue it. And her supervisor came in and said to her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm preparing the argument for the Supreme Court. And he said, oh, no. 
women aren't arguing in the Supreme Court. And so they took the case away from her at that point and gave it to a man to argue. So she had had, you know, she'd had a lot of experiences uh, like that. So, she, but she she overcame all of that, and uh, and we remarked a number of times when when we were sitting, how many women practitioners appeared before the court uh, to make oral argument, and how refreshing that was from the experiences that we'd had uh, in our day. Yeah. Well, that's where we'll have to leave it. Well. Thank you very much Thank you. for talking with us. We certainly appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And we also want to say thanks to you for watching, and we hope that you will join us again next time for another edition of Illinois Pioneers.